Hap Dunning was the environmental program at UC Davis, and he uh, really did it single-handedly and is responsible uh, for better in most cases, for perhaps for worse, the, the worse in my case, of, of launching uh, the careers of a whole number of environmental uh, lawyers and, uh, and academics and, and, and scholars and others. But uh, after teaching in, and, and traveling to and teaching in Ethiopia, Ethiopia for several years in the mid-1960s, uh, Hap came to uh, King Hall and UC Davis in 1969 uh, to begin teaching and, as I say, taught a number of courses, uh, property law, uh, environmental law, water law, natural resources law. Uh, and and he uh, has expertise in all of those areas, but I think he would be the first to tell you that uh, his, his first passion and his area of greatest expertise and, and academic interest is water, water policy, water law. Uh, and in that connection, in the 1970s, in the late 1970s, when Jerry Brown 1.0 was governor, uh, first time around, uh, Hap was, was asked to take a leave from uh, UC Davis' his teaching and, and, and scholarly duties at UC Davis Law School and become the executive director of a, a entity known as the Governor's Commission uh, to review California water rights law. And for a couple of years, he, uh, uh, he labored on that effort full time, uh, assisted with a number of then very recent uh, King Hall uh, law students, graduated law students, former law students uh, working with him, uh, to generate a number of recommendations to the governor and to the uh, California legislature uh, to reform California water rights law. A few of those got implemented, not nearly enough in my view, uh, and it's interesting, uh, again, to come back to the legislation that was just signed into law by Governor Brown 2.0 on Saturday uh, this past weekend. Uh, we're still seeing some of the recommendations that came out of uh, Professor Dunning's work and, and that of the uh, commission that he served, which was then led by and chaired by uh, then-retired California Chief Justice Donald Wright. Uh, we're still seeing some of those recommendations uh, uh, become transformed from policy recommendations to... Uh, to law. So uh, Professor Dunning is going to spend uh, his time uh, focusing on the issue of groundwater, uh, a subject that is most controversial and near and dear to uh, many of our hearts and uh, in many ways at the heart of the water uh, policy debate. Uh, following um, uh, Professor Dunning, we're going to hear from uh, Justice Ronald Roby. Uh, and I've known Justice Roby for many years as well. and. Uh, uh, he's the closest thing I know to a Renaissance man when it comes to water uh, and water policy because he has lived it, worked it uh, for many years. And while he's been on the bench uh, uh, since uh, probably for, according to this, uh, since the mid-1980s, I guess, from the 90s, mid-1980s, um, his first career was in water and water policy, and I, I think in many ways if you were to uh, to ask him. Uh, that's probably still his first love or at least a, an engaging uh, passion of his. And one of, the, one of the many unique things about Justice Roby uh, is that he has worked in all three branches of California state government where he has come into contact with and uh, influenced very greatly California uh, water policy. Early in his career he was a consultant to the uh, water policy committee in the committees in the California uh, State Legislature, uh, so he knows the legislative branch and, and uh, counseled and advised uh, uh, the state's legislators in the uh, formative stages uh, of California water law and after the, immediately after the California State Water Project came online. Uh, he was then uh, uh, tapped by uh, Governor Jerry Brown, 1.0. Uh, to assume two very important uh, uh, posts in California state government relating to water. Uh, he was the um, uh, member uh, and vice chair of the California State Water Resources Control Board uh, from 1969 through 1975. That, I'm sorry? That was Governor Reagan. Was it Governor Reagan? Oh, so you're a bipartisan <laughs> expert. Uh, uh, and uh, that's right, it was Governor Reagan who was the appointing authority. Um, and that's the same entity that Michael Lawfer, the chief counsel, who visited with us four weeks ago, uh, represents. But, uh, but uh, Justice Roby was in a policy-making position as one of five uh, water board uh, members. And then uh, it was Governor uh, Jerry Brown who, in 1975, uh, tapped uh, 
Ronald Roby to become his director of the Department of Water Resources, which is, uh, uh, and you've heard about that among other things, it shapes state water policy, it, it oversees uh, the operation of the state, California State Water Project and any number uh, of other uh, important obligations. Uh, and then he's, uh, uh, again, since the 1980s, he's been a jurist, a judge, first in the uh, trial court system, the, Cal the Sacramento County Municipal Court, when we had municipal courts in the state, and then the, the Superior Court, uh, and he was uh, ultimately elevated and appointed to serve in his current position as Associate Justice uh, the California uh, Court of Appeal, which is headquartered in uh, Sacramento. If all that were not enough, he uh, has spent a number of years teaching environmental law and water law at that other law school on the other side of the causeway, the McGeorge School of Law. Uh, he is the uh, co-convener and one of the uh, key, key personages behind the uh, a very welcome and I think uh, a worthwhile effort at judicial education called Dividing the Water, which, Waters, which provides education to state and federal court judges around the country on the particular challenges and opportunities of resolving uh, water disputes. So uh, he, he's uh, done all of that uh, and more. And uh, so after we hear from Professor Dunning, uh, we'll hear from Justice Roby on his uh, views of uh, uh, water writ large, uh, groundwater and surface water, and uh, some related uh, doctrines like the public trust doctrine. Uh, and we will leave time, of course, for uh, questions and insights from, from you as well. So without further ado, uh, Professor Harrison Dunning. Well, thank you, Rick. And I remember you very well from your law school days. Rick actually was one of the presidents of the Environmental Law Society at uh, King Hall, uh, an organization that's never had a bad year, that's been active uh, since about 1971. Rick uh, has continued over many years, most of them involved with environmental and natural resources law. Um, although when Rick was there, things had kind of quieted down. I started my law teaching career, as Rick mentioned, in Ethiopia. I was on the faculty of what was then known as Haile Selassie, the first university. And uh, I was there in the late 60s. It was turbulent. We had student riots all the time. Uh, the last year I was there, uh, they had a riot in which a number of students were killed by the police. Uh, they were all very much against Haile Selassie for reasons I don't have time to go in here. Anyway, we were shut down for a month. And uh, when I came back, I had the uh, courtesy of a soldier with a machine gun walking up and down in the hall just to keep an eye on things. And then I came to Davis thinking, oh, this would be nice and quiet. I, I'd been out of the country five years because I'd done some graduate legal work in Europe before I went to Ethiopia. Well, anti-Vietnam War, civil rights, assassination of JFK, Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King. Our law school at Davis is named the building, not the school, but the building is named for Martin Luther King. It's King Hall. So it was pretty turbulent. And I remember at one point, time of the Cambodian incursion, we shut down for a week. The University of California, the whole thing, we shut down for a week. And we had student forums, and we had hung hunger strikes going on in the quad. Uh, so things were a little quieter, I think, by the time you got to, to the law school. But uh, I'm here to talk about groundwater. It's always an important part of the California water supply. I'm just going to talk about California groundwater. Important part of the water supply. Um, Dr. Lund probably can tell you better than I how much it is exactly in an average year, but then he might say, well, there is no average year. So uh, if you just want to take a, a kind of somewhat normal year, my impression is it might be somewhere around 35 percent, maybe a little bit more, uh, with the rest being surface water. But of course, when you have a drought, the way we do now, and the surface water is, is very uh, unavailable. Uh, groundwater becomes a much higher percentage because people who are cut off on their uh, surface water supplies turn to groundwater if they have it. Now, not everybody has it. It doesn't occur every place, but it occurs lots of places. Now, every hydrologist I've ever talked with has emphasized that water exists in a single hydraulic cycle. It's all part of the same system, the surface water, the groundwater. There's interactions of all kinds. But for better or worse, the law in California has turned a blind eye to that scientific observation and has said, we are going to treat surface water and groundwater differently. No matter what the hydrologists say, we're going to do it differently. 
Now, just as a little background on surface water, back in the 1850s, California was the first western state to say, uh, we will allow a water right known as an appropriative right. Um, this happened on federal land, and uh, the courts in about the middle of the 1850s, uh, Irwin versus Phillips said, okay, if you go to a stream, and of course this is the mining time, right? That was the big industry in California in the 1850s. You go to a stream and you physically divert water and you put it to some beneficial use in connection with your mining activity, uh, you will have a right, and if a lot of people do that, we're going to sort them out by saying, first in time, first in right. So you have a priority system based on time. Uh, now, about that time and in later years, other Western states were following and also adopting the appropriative system, but they were saying, we're going to turn our back on the system that was used in the East and the Midwest, which is known as the riparian system, which gives water rights to people based on their ownership of land adjacent to the stream. They said, we're not going to have any of that. The West is too dry. It's not appropriate. Uh, there's a lot of contention in California a lot of contention for a long time about whether we were going to have riparian rights. Finally, in the 1870s, it was settled on a 4-3 vote uh, with a 200-page opinion. Now, you can imagine back in, you know, 1886 what it was like to produce a 200-page opinion. So they said, we're going to have both appropriative rights and riparian rights. Well, now, back in the 1800s, they weren't really doing much about groundwater. There wasn't the physical capacity. Uh, to utilize it, and we didn't have rules, but early in the 1900s, the courts got started on it. Uh, 1903, uh, the court, Supreme Court in California laid down an allocation system, which actually, in a way, kind of paralleled what had been done for surface water. A basic allocation scheme that was laid down in a case called Katz versus Walkinshaw was the first rights go to what they called overliers. Who's an overlier? somebody that owns land above the groundwater basin, the aquifer, and pumps it up and uses it on that land. Doesn't take it away, uses it on that land. They go first and they share among themselves, uh, sort of riparian-like in a way. Uh, and then if there's any water left over, it can go to appropriators. Typically an appropriator might be a municipality who puts in a well field, takes the water, sends it in a pipe to their city, their town, and uses it there. So initially, it was kind of like, kind of reflected what they did with surface water, but later it got very, very different. After the Second World War, they got into a doctrine known as mutual prescription. I won't go into that. It's quite complicated. There's no parallel to that in surface water allocation. So they went their own way. Uh, but I want to go back uh, to a very important development in California that happened in the time of the progressives. Uh, I assume you're all familiar with the progressive movement in American politics, and part of that was a desire to start to regulate natural resources, which pretty much had been exploited without any regulation. And uh, around 1911, uh, the state government set up what they called the Conservation Commission. Very high powered, because it was chaired by a former governor of the state, Pardee. And uh, the Conservation Commission was supposed to look at California natural resources and make some recommendations. Their report, when it came in, was more about water than anything else. And they said, um, you know, there'd been some minor requirements for appropriators. They had to maybe file a paper with the county uh, courthouse or something like that, but not very much. But they said that we ought to do what a number of other Western states had started to do beginning about 1890, and that is have a regulatory system for new appropriations. They didn't try to go back to all the old ones. They said, from now on, if somebody's going to appropriate water out of a stream, uh, they've got to go through an administrative process. It's commonly known as the permit and license process. You get a permit, you build your project, you go back and you get your, your license. Now, in that Conservation Commission report, uh, they considered, well, should this apply to groundwater? And there's a very significant paragraph, just one paragraph in that report, in which they said, we don't really know enough about groundwater. We don't understand groundwater. Groundwater is occult. Groundwater is mysterious. And of course, probably was true in 1911, 1912. Who, who the heck knew much about groundwater then? So they said, we're going to leave most groundwater out. They made one small exception. They said, if the water underground is in what they called a subterranean stream in a known <coughs> and definite channel, then it will be subject to the permit and license uh, 
system, but that's a small part of the water. Most of the water, which is underground, is commonly referred to as percolating groundwater. That is not subject to the permit and license system. So it is subject to some other restrictions, maybe, possibly sometimes public trust. Judge Roby is going to talk about that. Uh, subject to a reasonable beneficial use requirement, which is in the Constitution, but it's not subject to the, uh, to the permit and license system. Well, it was an inevitable consequence if you say to people, you can put a well anywhere you want and take all the water you want, there's going to be overdraft. Uh, what's overdraft? Well, there are some sophisticated definitions, but basically overdraft happens when you're pumping more out then is coming way in by way of replenishment. Replenishment could be from nature, water percolating down into the groundwater basin. It could be uh, from human activity. There are programs where people deliberately uh, percolate water into underground basins. But we started to get overdraft. More was being pumped out than was coming in. What's wrong with overdraft? You know, I mean, there was an argument for overdraft. Some people said, well, gee, we'll overdraft this groundwater basin and we'll develop all this economy and then the economy will pay to bring in supplemental surface water. That was one argument for it. But there are consequences. The deeper you have to go to get your water, the more it costs. You know, you're using electricity to pump the water out so the cost goes shooting up. There's water quality degradation as you go lower and lower into the groundwater basin. There's subsidence at the surface as the uh, basin is dewatered some layers can collapse, then the surface starts to collapse, then you get some damage possibly to structures or even to canals. Uh, the USGS did a report recently and, and showed instances where major canals like the Delta Mendota Canal were suffering from subsidence. And of course, uh, by pumping out a lot of groundwater, you may, one way or another, uh, be de decreasing the flow of the surface water. Remember the hydrologists say it's all related. So you can have a stream that was a gaining stream. It was gaining water as it went along, and the groundwater pumping happens, and it doesn't get the replenishment that it might get from groundwater one way or another. And so it's suddenly a losing stream. So there are a lot of consequences that aren't so good with regard to uh, <coughs> this uh, overdrafting. Now, we had a very dramatic situation in parts of urban Southern California, Orange County, Los Angeles County, near the ocean. They were pumping groundwater, and it looked like they were going to get salinity intrusion, seawater coming in from the ocean to the groundwater. Well, nobody wants to pump salt water. It's not going to be good in your garden. It's not going to be good on your farm. It's not going to be good at the tap when you drink it. So uh, it was a pretty serious problem. And pretty early, they got together, and they worked out some solutions. Starting as, as early as the 1930s, they started developing some localized groundwater management programs where they would limit pumping in various places and sometimes inject water to uh, form a barrier to the salinity intrusion. Um, one thing that helped them a lot is they, they had surface water to work with. Metropolitan Water District had been formed. It had gone to the Colorado River. It built an aqueduct. It was bringing water in and uh, so they could uh, uh, manipulate the surface water and the groundwater to try to stabilize the situation. There was a lot of overdraft on the east side of the San Joaquin uh, Valley, a farming area. And uh, I don't know if you've talked about it before, but of course we have the Central Valley Project in California uh, planned by the state. Um, we had state legislation authorizing it. The state couldn't afford it. The state went to the feds. The federal government took it over, the Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, took it over. CVP is run by the Bureau of Reclamation. One of their projects was Fryant Dam on the San Joaquin River, which was designed to take virtually all the flow of the river and send it to the east side of the San Joaquin Valley to help them overcome their overdraft problem. So <clears throat> your theme, I know, in this class is reconciling ecosystems and economy. And you might say, well, OK, we've talked about how people have used this water for farming and for cities. and and so forth. Uh, how were the ecosystems impacted? Well, I mentioned in uh, Orange County and LA County, they were helped out because they had Metropolitan bringing in Colorado River water. Of course, that was not the only one in the Colorado. Lots of people were taking Colorado River water, but a consequence was the uh, delta of the Colorado was pretty much destroyed 
um, by all the upstream exports. Uh, next week, I notice on your program, you're going to be talking about the delta here that we have in California, the Sacramento-San Joaquin River Delta, which is not far from us here, a fascinating area. You're going to have a whole uh, session on that, and you'll hear a lot about environmental issues in the delta. Um, the San Joaquin River, because they took all the water, except in flood years when they couldn't, and sent it to the east side, was uh, dried up for long distances below Friant Dam. So a salmon run was lost, entirely uh, extirpated. Uh, and now there are efforts to restore that, but it's tough going. Uh, flows were altered all over the place. Every time you put in a big dam, you're going to change the flows, you're going to change the temperature. Uh, the American River, the Trinity River, the Sacramento River, you've got this huge facility, part of the CVP on the Sacramento River, Shasta Dam, cuts off enormous areas that once were uh, available for spawning of fish like, like salmon. So, big problems. And uh, I don't know if anybody really thought much about reconciling the economy and the environment. I mean, my personal view is it's a matter of war, water war, all the time, here and there, with different groups with different objectives. Uh, with regard to groundwater specifically, I was fortunate enough, as Rick said, to be part of this effort uh, that uh, was authorized by Jerry Brown the first time around in the late 1970s. He set up a Blue Ribbon Commission. Uh, Judge Roby was ex officio on it because he was director of uh, the Department of Water Resources at that time. I was head of the staff. and. Uh, uh, we worked hard on groundwater, and we proposed a state law which in a way was quite limited. We said we should at least deal with the groundwater basins that are critically overdrafted. Uh, the Department of Water Resources had a classification scheme at the time, and they said there were 11 groundwater basins in California that were critically overdrafted, eight of them in the San Joaquin Valley. And we said, well, um, local entities should be mandated to do something about it, not stop it right away, that's out of the question, but to develop a plan so that over a period of time uh, you could uh, reduce and possibly even eliminate the overdraft. And we said the state should review these plans and if they're not adequate, the state should be empowered to step in and do the job. Well, this got nowhere in the legislature. We filed our report. Uh, Justice uh, Donald Wright uh, gave it to the governor. He gave a brilliant uh, press conference about how you couldn't overdraft your bank account, so how come you can overdraft your groundwater? And uh, I think you were talking about this, uh, Jay, recently uh, in your blog. Anyway, uh, the Farm Bureau, California Farm Bureau Federation, the Association of California Water Agencies, the Chamber of Commerce, all came out full force and said, you can't do that. You can't tell people what they can pump. They said, we do need groundwater management, but what groundwater management is, is more supplemental water, surface water from some other place. Uh, just the way uh, the San Joaquin water had been taken to um, <coughs> the east side of the valley and, and other uh, imported water had been used, Colorado water used in Southern California. They said the north coast, a lot of water up there. There's the Eel River. Uh, well, um, they seem to, Ignore the fact that Governor Reagan, one of the environmental things he did was take the Eel River out of the plan for the state water project. He'd done that um, maybe a little bit for environmental reasons, also because some Native American groups up there were protesting. So he'd put it on the back burner. And then not long after we did our work with the commission, there were wild and scenic designations at both the state and federal level that happened with regard to those rivers. So it seems to me in a situation like Right now, they're talking about this in uh, Palos uh, Robles area. They're talking about it in eastern Stanislaus County, where you've got no imported water that's feasible to bring in. If you're going to deal with the overdraft, you've got to deal with demand management. And uh, I don't know uh, from statements I've seen from the Farm Bureau Federation, I don't think their attitude has really changed. And unless there's significant support within the agricultural community, which is politically very powerful in California, I doubt we will get it. Okay, well, that's all I have, Ron, you're on. Well, on that happy note, um, <laughs> well, as Rick said, I've been observing this uh, situation for a long time. And um, back in uh, 1978, I was more naive than I am now, um, although, because uh, when we went to the governor and suggested this commission, and he had been governor for three years, we thought he had, we could create the momentum, got the 
retired Chief Justice, who was a little bit miffed when we asked him to serve because uh, uh, there was some problem with the transition between Roseburg, but in any event, uh, or with whoever else was there. But anyway, he was unhappy with the governor for making appointments too slow. But in any event, um, we thought that the commission was going to be a really uh, uh, good thing. The reports that uh, happened, the uh, staff people put out, are still sort of the Bible uh, for people who uh, want to know what changes in the law should be made. Um, but, um, and I was always optimistic that things would get better, um, but they really haven't. And you know, there's one just general observation. I'm going to talk about three or four different topics. But uh, as one general observation, um, uh, there's, always, there's the same amount of water in the world as we had back then and a long time before that. Uh, we don't have any new dams. We haven't had any new dams since 1980, uh, since we left, since that commission. Uh, we have some uh, local things that have been done by water contractors to stretch their water. State Water Project doesn't have the capability of delivering another drop of water beyond what they had the capability back in 1983. Um, and the federal government and the state uh, has sort of become a Christian, so to speak, on, on the environmental issues because Congress passed the Central Valley Water Project Improvement Act and dedicated a large amount of the yield of the Central Valley Project to environmental needs back in 1992. And as a result of that, actually the, the CVP has more, uh, fewer uh, acre feet of water to deliver than it had uh, back then. So we're not going forward, we're going backward. Uh, the, other the other observation, uh, sort of as a preface to what I'm gonna say is that, uh, you know, the weather goes up and down. And the problem with motivating people um, is that when there's a drought and bad times, people get motivated. In the drought of 77, which I was uh, chosen to preside over, um, everybody panicked and they did all these wonderful things you're seeing now. Um, but as soon as the rains came again, everybody forgot about them. I had this save water motto for DWR and they threw it away. Um, I still have save water buttons if anybody wants them. But anyway, the point is that that, that was true of groundwater too. There were times in the 1940s when the coastal uh, basins in Los Angeles where the water was coming to the surface and at times they were impairing the uses of the land because the water, groundwater basins were so full of water. And what happened after the 70s was we had some good years and the groundwater crisis, uh, you know, we had subsidence prior to 1978 and the professors will give you all the details, but in the period after that, the groundwater basins uh, came back a bit and uh, and, and so there wasn't any, any criticality about it. And, and then, coming with the Central Valley Water Project Improvement Act, where they dedicated more water to uh, environmental concerns, and that's for both outflow for the delta, to protect the delta, and also for things, um, other environmental factors, including um, uh, ultimately the San Joaquin River restoration. All of that meant that people pumped more. So they pumped more because they had less surface water. And because as Hap so carefully and wonderfully laid out the system, uh, you can do anything you want, uh, as long as you can afford to deepen your well. And so what's happened in the last 10 or 15 years is the combination of CVP contractors getting uh, less water than they had previously gotten, and the fact that we've had not necessarily that great of years, um, the groundwater basins before the drought of this year was precariously sinking down. Uh, I don't know, 25 acre feet, I mean 25 feet of subsidence in some areas. That kind of, those kind of numbers existed back in the 60s, but we haven't heard those kind of numbers since. And, and now you see pictures in, down by Bakersfield and other places where the, the ground is now 25 or 20 feet lower than it was uh, it, it's just like they marked floods, you know, this is the opposite, you know, we have a big stick that says, here's where the floodwaters were back in 1980-something. Now you say, here's where the land was in 1980. So, so what we have is we have a tremendously greater problem with groundwater than we had before. Uh, it's the major <laughs> issue. And if it's ever regulated, other than the kind of self-preservation regulation that took place back down in the in the coastal plains, the coastal basins, as Pat pointed out, the answer is going to have to be they're going to cut back use because you cannot regulate the, the water and just let everybody do the same thing they're doing today. And that's why people don't want regulation. 
because they know regulation means um, uh, less water. Uh, unless they can have a ready source of surface water to take its place, which they don't have. And as a result, they're, now to sort of deal with the theme of the class, there's tremendous <laughs> economic dislocation if they actually did regulate groundwater. Now, maybe if they'd done it years ago, and the system had been placed in 1914, or even in 1978, it might be uh, less of a dislocation to have uh, these kind of things. Um, but the, the current system is terribly inefficient because you can do whatever you want. And there are some really serious problems in the San Joaquin Valley with small communities, with nitrates in the water supply and things like this. And these small communities uh, don't have the economic resources of large corporate farmers who can just put in new wells. And so they have bad water supplies. They don't even have good drinking water. One of the things the governor's program does is to try to give money to small communities who can't even serve their domestic water supplies. And there's a whole social justice movement in the San Joaquin Valley trying to make certain that some of the poor areas, and they're often minority uh, areas of the, of the valley, have adequate water supplies. Meanwhile, people are just pumping away all they want for these other uh, sources. Um, and nobody regulates what they do. Now, uh, I tried to settle a groundwater adjudication down in in the Antelope Valley for almost well, over a year, uh, uh, about a year ago. I, I did it as a favor to a Superior Court judge who's handling the case. And we had all the people in the room, the farmers, the uh, urban users. And, we try, and, and one of the problems with an adjudication is you have to name every single landowner in a basin. So in the Antelope Valley alone, that may be 10,000 people. They have to be served with a lawsuit. And it was just, uh, lawsuits don't lend themselves to this kind of stuff. But, um, Anyway, um, I discovered that the farmers, some of the farmers there who were uh, opposed to settling, because once again, to settle the lawsuit and agree on an adjudication means you have to reduce your use of water. Because the, the basin's in overdraft. That means more is going out than coming in. So if you have an adjudicated basin, the basin is going to be as much coming in as goes out, which means if you don't have that much more coming in, you have to stop what goes out. And so they were squeezing. Uh, if that, now, the court's going to ultimately adjudicate that, and the court will do it, but they should have done it voluntarily. It, they have, they're going to go from 180,000 acre feet to 110. So there's a substantial reduction. There is no law that says that the farmers get cut back any, any, um, any more or less than everybody else. And they're overlying landowners, as Pap said, so they have sort of first priority. They are growing alfalfa in the Antelope Valley, which is way down at, over the Tehachapi's big pump, pumps, seven and a half acre feet of water per acre to grow alfalfa. Now, if anybody here is in doing agricultural economics, that's just bizarre. That in the, in the hot southern semi-deserts, where imported water is extraordinarily expensive because it has to be pumped all the way, comes all with more of it everywhere. Up here, it goes all over the Tehachapi's 3,000 feet. And the groundwater, uh, they use groundwater and seven and a half acre feet per acre of water. I mean, that is absolutely absurd. But um, the Water Board hasn't gone in on a, uh, on a uh, waste of water. Nobody wants to do it. Um, no individual is going to do it. So you have very inefficient uses of water. Uh, that's true everywhere, that water is not regulated. But um, the longer we go, the worse it's going to be. So enough about groundwater. I mean, I, I thought his, his message was dreary enough, and I just made it worse. Um, but uh, the climate change is coming. Uh, climate change is already here. And uh, uh, Rick mentioned, Professor Frank mentioned, that I'm involved with Dividing the Waters, which is a group of water judges from uh, all over the country, but mostly from the Western United States, but we have some water disputes in other parts of the country. And our job is to try to help judges uh, who do water cases uh, understand better the physical and the biological facts and uh, try to relate their adjudicatory functions to uh, scientific facts. And we have regular conferences. And um, one of the, the conference we're going to have in May of this year at the University of Oregon uh, deals with the interface between land use and water. And California has struggled with um, this issue. 
uh, because public agencies frequently uh, in California said, oh, sure, we'll, get, we'll serve you water, even though they knew darn well they didn't have it to serve. And so then uh, local government agencies approved subdivisions, new cities, and everything else uh, on the promise of water, which they didn't have. And so we've used uh, statutory, uh, uh, we've created a statute that says you have to show me the water if you have more than 500 uh, home uh, subdivision, although I noticed there are a lot of 499 home subdivision. But um, the point is that if you have more than 500, uh, 500 or more, then uh, you have to show the water. And this is part of our California Environmental Quality Act analysis, where you have to show that there's water available. Uh, but the land and water interface in California is, um, is fragmented because land use is local. Uh, water is either law of the jungle if it's groundwater or the water board uh, if it's not. Uh, so that's a coming issue. But climate change is going gonna, is gonna to mess up everything because existing uh, appropriations are going to be perhaps unable to operate the way they were. In other words, if the irrigation season runs from April to July or whatever, uh, maybe with the change in the way the climate is bringing snow and everything, maybe the season will be later or earlier, but the water rights are very rigid because, as Professor Dunning said, uh, they're based on first in time, first in right, based on when, when you use the water historically. And so uh, my colleagues all over the, the West are trying to figure out what to do with existing rights. Now, we have um, the public trust. Public trust doctrine was created in 1983 by the California Supreme Court in the National Audubon Society case. And um, it is a doctrine which is just like the old public trust of la tidelands and, uh, and waters. Uh, it applies to, to the waters in the streams. And the Water Board uh, has, under the opinions of our court and, and the Supreme Court, gave them a primary responsibility for implementing the public trust in the actions that they take uh, in preventing waste and unreasonable use of water and in is, I issuing new water rights. Um, the, a private party can bring a lawsuit under the public trust. Um, so a water right, uh, the best example of the fact that water rights, which have historically been rigid, and once they're uh, issued a license for this water and you've used it, you can't change it. The state can't take it away from you. The best example is Mono Lake, the Los Angeles exports from the Mono Basin. Uh, those water rights were fixed and licensed and guaranteed in 1974. I actually voted on the water board to make that, that decision. Um, and under the public trust, those water rights were changed. They were modified to reduce the amount that the city took so that more water could flow into Mono Lake. In a, in a simple way, that decision modified an existing vested water right, for those of you who know legally what a vested right means. In other states, vested water rights can't be moved by the public trust. They have to figure out other ways to try to accommodate their existing water rights system to the changes that might come with climate change. Um, and so that is an extraordinary uh, problem. Um, and both with groundwater cutbacks and the impact of climate change on existing rights, there are potentially enormous economic dislocations. There's where economics comes in. I, I've never understood economics, and I've always sort of joked about it, but it's real that there's enormous uh, California economy because so much of our water is used for agriculture is based on the use of this mined, overdrafted groundwater. And the dislocations and the, and the harm that's going to come to not only the farmers, but to everybody related to the, the agricultural uses is going to be great. And that's why the thing that bothers me most about why we're here today or why we got where we are today, that is if we'd taken an orderly, uh, if we made an orderly effort to regulate this stuff back in the 70s or at least after the 70s, then things wouldn't come all of a sudden bang. And that's what's going to happen in the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, things are bad enough now, and if, if the weather, does, if we don't have these huge gully washers and the basins suddenly start filling up again, there's going to be people who are going to have to cut back. Uh, people are going to go out of business, and, and it's going to be bad, and it's going to be disorderly because we're going to let not the market, but just whatever, whoever's located, wherever the best location is survives, and the one that isn't doesn't. 
uh, and the state's sort of standing by saying, well, can't do anything about it. And, uh, and the legislation that came through in 2009, I believe, where they wanted to have everybody record what they took out of groundwater because then you'd have an idea of what's going on. Um, they said, no, we don't want you. We don't want to tell you. Uh, we don't want you coming on our land to, to, to get a test well to figure out. Uh, the only good thing, I guess, is that we have now uh, infrared photography and things where you can take a look at the underground from above and try to figure out what's going on under. So science maybe are, uh, come to our rescue. But you know, that's why back in 1913, uh, people said, we don't know anything about groundwater because nobody had ever been down there. And that sounds silly, but that's true. Um, and there was no central registry of what people were pumping. Uh, you didn't have to get a, a, a permit to dig a well. So consequently, um, we didn't know anything. We know more now. And now the scientists are telling us that we know there's groundwater overdraft. Even without the land sinking, we know we've got an idea now uh, about how much water is in the basin and how much there used to be. But we don't know which person is taking more, who's doing what, because that's the missing link. Um, so the bottom line is, in California, we are more flexible. We can more flexibly deal with the crisis of groundwater, and we can more flexibly deal with climate change if anybody has the political will to do it. And that is the critical uh, issue. And the, the water board, I uh, hope you gave him, uh, Michael Lauper, he's a very good guy, but I hope you gave him a hard time and said, what are you going to do? And are you really going to do it? And I think Governor Brown has talked about groundwater in, uh, in his uh, drought plan, in his water plan for California, which he released when he, uh, shortly after becoming governor again. And he mentioned groundwater. And I think back in 1975, well, he wouldn't have, other than the commission's efforts, he wouldn't have dared to mention groundwater because it was too radioactive to be even talked about. So we, we clothed it with a commission. That's how we dealt with it. Now he's talking about doing something. He isn't being explicit because nobody knows for sure what to do. But it's on the radar now. And uh, the, I think um, if things get worse, as a matter of fact, then um, there's going to be uh, a potential for something coming. Uh, but the, the question that I have is, is it too little um, too late? Uh, on, the, on the same general um, topic, I've written down here, the environmental component of water use hangs by a thread. Um, the Central Valley Project Improvement Act was passed in uh, 1992. Surprisingly enough, that President Bush was president. Uh, surprisingly, uh, it passed. It was something that Congressman George Miller had wanted to do forever. And, um, uh, it, it, it put environmental uh, quality on an equal footing in, under the federal law with the delivery of water supplies. Uh, it made them equal partners. Um, but uh, today there's a house, house passed legislation to undo most of it or significantly undo that. In the name of the drought, but people in the valley have never been satisfied with having the San Joaquin River restored. Um, Dedication of water to environmental purposes has never been easy. And uh, it's going to be harder than ever now. Um, and how many times in, in the public uh, discourse you will hear, uh, water for people, not for fish. Uh, water for people, not for you name, whatever else it is. Um, and, and you know what's happened is in the drought of 1977, the, um, the water quality standards in the Delta were relaxed significantly, just as they were. Uh, what, J January 31st. The water quality standards in the Delta were relaxed under, uh, the water board relaxed them, uh, and the governor suspended various laws under his emergency powers. Uh, he suspended certain laws that um, uh, protected those uh, water quality standards. And everybody understood. Uh, everybody understood that um, when everything is as bad as it is now, when they're delivering no water to contractors, you have to uh, you have to make uh, cuts in the water dedicated to environmental protection too. But the kind of harm that may come from that if it goes too far or lasts too long might not just be uh, temporary. It might be more long lasting. Um, and uh, we can't change the Endangered Species Act, but I, I do think that that everybody understands that things have to be done in a crisis. The problem is. 
that out of this crisis, will, will anything good come? That's really the issue. And the, uh, the economists should let everybody know that unless you do some orderly management of groundwater, you're going to have economic uh, consequences that you can't control. And if you start developing a program of regulation and to accommodate land and water and accommodate climate change and make the changes in water rights necessary, um, if, you, if you do that in an orderly manner, uh, in a comprehensive way, you have the potential, I think, of making a, the system work. Uh, otherwise, it's just going to be a little disaster here, disaster there, and, and who knows whether collectively they'll all be a total disaster. Now, uh, remember, everything is connected to everything else. We take a lot of water from the Colorado River. Back in 1963, when the California was basically ordered by the Supreme Court to cut back, um, California panicked, but it took almost uh, 40, 50 years before they actually really had to cut back. So like everything else, we lived on, on borrowed time. And, and now we're, we're taking significantly less water out of the Colorado than we have been historically. So not only do we have no more water supplies, we have less water from places that we used to rely on. And then uh, over the last 10 years, the Colorado River Basin has, been, has had less uh, runoff than historically contemplated. Uh, the Colorado River Compact was in 1922, the Boulder Canyon Project Act in 29. That was based on the water conditions that existed then. And you know, history has shown that those were wet years. And, you know, um, and so the, the basis, the theoretical basis for all these water rights on the Colorado River are in real doubt now. And uh, places, my, my defining the water colleagues at other parts of the Colorado system are, are not getting the amount of water they want uh, out of the Colorado any more than we are. So uh, they got some snow this year. Maybe that'll make a difference. But um, the, the Colorado River reservoirs are at all-time lows, Lake Mead and Lake Powell. Uh, their, their water supplies are at all-time low. So um, the, the, the whole system of just waiting until things take care of themselves has not worked. So that's my message. It's not much more cheerful than perhaps. All right. Well, why don't we take some uh, questions and comments? Or Professor Benning back to your mouth. Not often that you have an opportunity. That's a professor gets is used to taking questions all the time, but now the sitting judge, or in this case a justice, <laughs> he, he or she usually asks the questions. But uh, you have an opportunity to hear your justice. What are the measures uh, the state government has initiated to check usage of groundwater? Well, they haven't checked the usage of groundwater. The, this has happened in local areas, as I said, Orange County, L.A. County, West Basin, Central Basin. But that was the whole thing uh, we were trying to do in the 70s was to get the state government involved, at least in the critically overdrafted basins. It wasn't for the whole state. It was just for those 11 basins, and that flopped. So, the problem uh, now is... The, 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 the way government typically comes in with regard to groundwater is to tell you you've got to get a permit to make sure your well is built properly. Well construction is looked at by government because they don't want faulty wells. But once you've got the well and it's passed muster in terms of how it's constructed, pump away whatever you want. And, and if, if, if you're not getting water, if your well goes dry, deepen it. Yeah, my, my sister-in-law lives up in the Surprise Valley up in Modoc County. And uh, you know where it is, but nobody else does. I mean, I, it's in the, just about as far away from here as you can be without being in either Oregon or Nevada. And um, she lives on a little stream. And it was really so funny because back in, the, in 2005, I had a tr traditional old water rights dispute between Mr. Bra uh, Mr. Barnes and Mr. Hussa. And um, they fought over a very small amount of water under an, pre-1914 water right. And when I went up to see her uh, last summer, she, uh, I discovered, number one, that both these litigants are still there fighting over water. And number two, the stream they took the water out of is where she runs through her property and her well is right next door. But she doesn't have a water right. She doesn't have a surface water right. Um, 
And uh, she has just gone out and hired a, um, a well person uh, to figure out how much it's going to cost to lower uh, her well. Because in this little valley, they're growing alfalfa up here at 6,000 feet elevation. And all during this drought, they're pumping away, growing all the alfalfa just like they were last year. The whole valley's green. And here's this individual. Uh, she's really worried that she's not going to have enough water to run her house. Um, and that's just a practical example. Amazing. And there, there's nobody she can turn to. Today, agriculture, the, the orchards and vines are about 3 million acres of this 9 million acres of irrigated land. Do you think this trend of more permanent crops, where they really have to have that water during droughts, groundwater during droughts usually, is, is going to lead the larger farmers to have a, take an interest in see, seeing that the groundwater is regulated so that they will know they have an assured supply for this very high value crop during... I haven't seen any evidence so far. I, I, hear, I hear inklings down that the they want to have... in groundwater regulation now. Well, I'm glad to hear that. It, I mean, as I said at the end of my talk, unless some significant segment of the agricultural community supports uh, some kind of initiative on groundwater management that deals with demand, then I don't think it'll happen. Yeah, I think, you know, back, going back to what Hap said about back then, the, the commission um, was still timid because of the environment, and we recommended local control. Uh, and, and to this day, I think local control is the only way you're going to get it. Uh, I mean, nobody's going to have the state doing it. Um, but they're going to have to have a, a local uh, inventory of wells and a, a local uh, evaluation of how much water they can safely take and some regulatory mechanism of, of reducing overdraft. Um, the litigation way, I mean, everybody says, you know, when you Frankenstein lawsuit, lawyers always like to talk about the Frankenstein lawsuit. I mean, most water lawsuits are Frankenstein because they have so many lawyers. But if you tried to adjudicate basins in the San Joaquin Valley, you'd have so many parties. You'd have so much work. And just like when I tried to settle the Allen Valley case, I had 80 people in the room, and that was just a representative group. Um, you can't do it by litigation. You have to do it by people willing to come together and say, we're going to turn over this subject to a local entity or a regional agency of some kind with the authority to really work it out. And so the big players are going to have to go along with it. Peter? Okay. One thing that bothers me is that the subsidence you mentioned of, on the, in the San Joaquin Valley has clearly doing a lot of damage to infrastructure. To right. The California aqueduct, to roads, to Aren't the farmers liable in any way for that damage? <laughs> I question. have no idea, uh, Peter. I have no idea. I do think that. Um, I mean, I do think that you know, the, the economic damage to say water project is going to be awful if this happens beyond what it's already happened. Um, I don't really know because see, they're going to claim they have rights to this water, and they're just exercising their rights. I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. Um, um, well, and they do have rights. And they do have rights. They do have rights. They have some right because they're, the law says that they're an overlying pumper. But how much their right is. But it's not the same as swinging you. You can only swing your arm until you meet somebody's nose. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you'd think that they would be worried about, um, uh, they would be really worried about uh, the fact that the pipeline, I mean, it's not a pipeline, it's a canal, but the way of getting water to Kern County is, is threatened by this. Right. If the thing goes out and they can't deliver water down there. Uh, you know, I mean, and I was, and I was director when we had some problems with the aqueduct. It's not easy uh, to necessarily fix it, particularly if it had a massive failure. Uh, it's you got to so link the pumping to the groundwater. You know, as a general matter, this is cause and effect, but to get individual people and haul them into court and say, because you pump so much, we have a big crack in the canal. But that may not be easy to show. I mean, I know. And you guys know better than I do, through all the studies, 
how, how bad the subsidence really is, but I think it's just about as bad as it's been in a long time. Um, how much flexibility is there in um, being able to transfer water rights, sell, uh, sell your water rights, and what role can legislators play in um, making, you know, incentivizing yeah. Better allocation of rights. That's a very important topic, and it's one that our commission worked on. We didn't just work on groundwater; we worked on that as well. And um, there are an awful lot of economists who say one of the solutions is really to have a much better water market. And sometimes we've had a market where government's been involved. The uh, Department of Water Resources had a big program at one point where they would acquire water rights and then give them to other people, or you can have transfers directly. You know, a, an alfalfa grower, in, or maybe a, I should say an almond grower, in uh, the San Joaquin Valley might deal with some rice people up in the Sacramento Valley. And some of those things have happened, and, and they are beneficial. Um, and uh, Judge Roby mentioned that the, we had this big loss in the Supreme Court in 1963 with regard to our share of the Colorado, and now it's come home to roost. But one of the things that happened is, um, the, the major user down in that part of California is the Imperial Irrigation District in the Imperial Valley. And they've made deals um, with various entities, including the San Diego County Water Authority. And there's been litigation. He was involved in, in uh, one of the appeals and knows all about it. But um, they uh, gradually are getting this thing in shape. And, and they're going to, I mean, a lot of times farmers can be more efficient, but it costs money. So where do you get the money? Well, one way you get the money is sell some of your rights. And the idea is not to, uh, I think in most cases, the idea is not to sell your water rights and just follow the land. The idea is to sell uh, some of your water and receive money and use the money to increase the efficiency so you can maintain production. So whether it's laser land leveling or drip irrigation or something else, um, these things can help, but they all cost money, and this is one source of money for the farmers. You know, the University of California has done an awful lot in this area over the years. Back, as far back as when I was director, they, uh, we developed, um, uh, uh, the university developed uh, and the department participated in these efforts to um, manage how much water you use in your crops by having uh, sensors and, uh, and making certain that you didn't use any more water than, uh, than you had to use. So agriculture's gotten more efficient in many areas, um, but the underlying problems of um, the Wild West water rights have, haven't come along. So even though people are a lot more efficient, I like to think that maybe because they're more efficient now, the disaster hasn't occurred earlier. Uh, because, you know, we're still operating on the same amount yeah. of water, developed water, that we've always had. State constitution since 1928 has prohibited waste or unreasonable use of water. But there's big arguments about what is waste. Uh, in some parts of, say, the San Joaquin Valley, sometimes you find flood irrigation. The water is just flooded across the land. And some people look at that and say, what a waste of water. Other people say, wait a minute, whatever the tree doesn't take up, it's going to percolate into the groundwater basin and the groundwater is a source, so there's no waste. Well. You can get into lots of things about evaporation and other things and debate that back and forth. But we do have, I mean, I think it's kind of a sleeping giant. We have very little um, reported cases, very few reported cases on that, the meaning of that provision. It, it was important, particularly in the Imperial Valley, and, and may have really been the predicate to one of these transfers that I talked about. But in other parts of the state, there's just been real reluctance to use it. I mean, there's been petition after petition to the State Water Board to say, look, irrigating land on the west side where selenium is heavy and saliniferous runoff causes big problems is unreasonable. Well, they wouldn't even take the petition. It's too hot to handle. I was wondering if um, you've heard anything or if it's ever come up in conversation with the soon to occur implementation or possibly soon to occur implementation of the Food Safety Modernization Act and the stipulations in there for water quality of produce growers. And 
the fact meaning that eventually growers might have to be responsible, legally responsible, for the quality of the water that they use to irrigate their produce, especially you know, if it's a covered commodity under the rule. Um, therefore, there's motivation to use groundwater because groundwater is typically cleaner than surface water. And that's still not really figured out who has jurisdiction over the quality of the water when surface water sources are being used. Obviously, the law isn't quite in effect yet, but it's a big debate that's kind of going on right now, and I wonder if you have any comments on that. I don't know really anything about that. I'm going to have to pass on that, but it sounds very, very important. Do I, I don't either. Um, I, don't, I don't really know anything about it except that uh, uh, groundwater isn't necessarily any cleaner. I mean, it's uh, not subject to surface contaminants, but uh, there is groundwater that is, has been adversely affected by use of uh, fertilizers and things. Groundwater supplies. Nitrates were mentioned. Nitrates and things like that. So. Okay. Uh, I mean, if you're talking about uh, things that can make you sick, then uh, that's probably true. Follow with that. Uh, and one is, is um, and I'm curious. I, I think that there's competing interest for using the aquifers, not just to recharge the water, but for carbon storage and for uh, salinity and so on. So that's one. I mean, on both sides, I mean, maybe overusing it, but on hand, how it's. Well, not just carbon storage, but water storage. But, I mean, but also storage with salinity, so go to the. So that's, that's one. But, but in. Relationship to that, I was, my interest was piqued about having a systematic rather than an adult in the solution. How, how do you foresee that coming? I mean, do you see that from the governor's um, sort of a special commission? Well, you know, I, I have no idea except that uh, the state, the big S, is not popular anywhere. Um, and uh, I, I think that it's, got, it's up to uh, counties or co collections of counties to get together and to try to fashion something that they can say is the right solution for our particular part of California. Um, um, I guess I've been uh, observing this system for 60 years and nothing really has happened. And I think, I think that we have to go uh, the most uh, uh, local way as possible if we have any hope at all, since nobody is clamoring for solutions, even local ones at this point. Um, and, and, and the typical reaction of the congressional representatives, at least in the House, is just build some more dams. Um, the problem is these dams have been studied before temperance flat and uh, enlarging uh, Shasta. And those kind of things were being studied when I was director. Uh, they're enormously expensive. They have environmental impacts. They have Native American impacts. And they don't really produce an awful lot of more uh, water. Um, and um, uh, and so, um, and, and even if they were to build them, and they're talking about now authorizing them, but not providing any money for them, so they'll, everybody will feel good because it's on the books, but it won't result in anything. Those kind of things uh, take forever to build. And um, so, I mean, I, I just think that they, people have to recognize that you have to live with what you have. And, um, and what you have may go up and down from year to year, but you have to plan for the worst. Well, we've given you a lot of gloom and doom, but there is a bright spot, and, and Judge Roby touched on it earlier, and that's the Mono Basin. Uh, if you're interested in that whole story, there's a, a book by an author named John Hart, H-A-R-T. It's called Storm Over Mono. And uh, basically, it was students who discovered the problems. Um, the city of Los Angeles, who was the Department of Water Power, was diverting maybe 100,000 acre feet of water out of that basin and taking it down and putting it in the aqueduct that ran to Los Angeles. And uh, there, were, there were students from Stanford and from Davis that got federal money from the SOS project that was run by the National Science Foundation. It was student-originated studies. They spent a summer up there and they said, you know, we're going to be in big trouble here if the lake level drops further. They'd already, Owens Lake further south had already dried up. They said, look, um, we've got air quality problems. Uh, we've got growing salinity. As a, I mean, this lake is already twice as salty as the ocean, but it was getting saltier and saltier. Uh, no fish in it, but lots of invertebrate life. The invertebrate life was food for birds. 
And um, so they sort of put up a, a warning and they did something that most science uh, researchers don't do. They went on and they formed an activist group, the Mono Lake Committee, and they teamed up with National Audubon Society, which of course has a big interest in birds, and they brought a lawsuit and they pleaded the public trust doctrine, which had been used since the 1850s in California, but not for water rights, and they won their case. And what I always try to emphasize when I talk about that situation is you can talk about the legal victory, but there was also a tremendous political effort. Uh, the Mono Lake Committee did a very smart thing. They worked in the lion's den. They worked in Los Angeles and they built support and they had all these bumper stickers and they had all these events and eventually they got support on the city council. And I think that's the main reason that after many years when the state water board came down with a decision that was kind of a compromise decision, Los Angeles did not go back to court. They said, we can live with this. And uh, the Mono Lake Committee had helped them get money uh, <clears throat> to do more water conservation. They had a great big low flow toilet program, for example, where they put low flow toilets in all over the place. And, and, and Los Angeles, although the population has gone this way, the water use has gone down. It's been an amazing story. So you can solve some of these problems. It's not hopeless. I would agree. The, the political leadership of Los Angeles got on board with good things uh, under Mayor Bradley and beyond. Um, and that was a truly environmental victory because um, how many times we heard the argument that why say Mono Lake? It's not good for anything. And uh, the only good it was for was for the environment. And it was not, for, it, you know, it's not drinking. Uh, it's both saline and alkaline. It's not no. good for drinking. Um, and you're denying people their farms and their homes and their lawns uh, for a bunch of birds. But that didn't go, and that's not what happened. And it was really a significant environmental victory. And um, uh, one thing the governor did, though, Governor Brown set up a task force called the Mono Lake Task Force. At the time, Secretary Andrews was Secretary of the Interior. And uh, it, it, five to one, it, uh, it recommended uh, that the... Um, uh, city be uh, cut back, and the only no vote was city of Los Angeles. So the governor sponsored that task force. The state was on it, the various federal agencies, and they all stood for saving Mono Lake. So they got a political momentum that went beyond California and had this, the federal agencies actually supporting it. So it's remarkable. And it can happen in agriculture, too. My, my favorite example was the rice industry. Um, Years ago, the rice industry had three major problems. They were burning their stubble and sending smoke into Sacramento. They were using herbicides that were getting into the water supply of Sacramento, and they were using all this water, six or seven acre feet an acre. It seemed like a huge amount of water. Mark Reisner wrote this famous book, uh, Cadillac Desert, in which he said it's a monsoon crop in a semi-arid area. It's ridiculous. Well, they had to throw out their leadership to make change. They fired their manager of their association. They fired their lawyers. They started disking the stubble instead of burning it. They started ponding the runoff water until the herbicide levels came down to an acceptable level. And they started fall and winter flooding. So they said, yeah, we use a lot of water for rice, but we're going to take a lot of our water and, and put it on the fields at times when it's not being used to grow rice, but it's for the, uh, the ducks and the geese and so forth that are migrating. So they... They made a lot of changes, and uh, I, I admire what they did. So change can happen in agriculture, too. Yep. Are you optimistic about the state of the salt and sea, given its ecological significance now? That's really a tough, tough problem. I guess I would have to say I'm not too optimistic, but I'm not close to it. I haven't followed it as carefully as I've followed some of the other disputes. And that's a consequence. I mentioned the uh, you know, Imperial Irrigation District and the deal they worked out with San Diego County Water Authority, but that's the side impact. They don't have the, uh, the wastewater flowing into the Salton Sea the way it used to, and so the outlook is not so good. So, you know, that's, that's a tough one. What do you think? Well, the litigation's still pending, and I can't talk about it. <laughs> um, if, the, if the current water rights system here in California is inflexible, and I would submit that it is, um, 
And we've got issues such as you just as Roby talked about that we're growing alfalfa, you know, low low grade, low quality crops, low low cash crops, cotton, rice, um, in a semi arid environment. Um, the economists, the resource economists say, you know, add add a little more flexibility, improve, enhance water markets as a way to deal with that, let the let, let the money talk, let the economy, free economy work. Uh, but I guess the, the nagging question that I have in that regard is this idea that is, I think, well established in California law is that water is ultimately a public resource rather than a private resource. It says that in the water code, that the people on the, uh, the water of the state of California, individuals and, and farms and, and ranchers have a right to use it, uh, but they don't own it. Um, how, how do we, how do you reconcile uh, those, those competing interests, the idea of water as a public resource uh, and kind of trying to monetize water and make water a more fungible resource uh, among water, private well, water users. Well, we talked before about water transfers and part of a water transfer ought to be some kind of regulatory review or potential regulatory review. I mean, we do a lot of that with land. The government has a lot to say about how private people use their land. And we can have a lot to say about how they use their water. Now, use rights are property rights. You know, I've never bought the idea they're not. Um, they may, I, I'm not sure. There are very many examples of where it's ever made a difference that we say the people or the state own the water and appropriators or riparians have use rights. I don't know, have you come across a case where some judge said, well, that's all, that, there's the key. I don't think it matters, really. I mean, it's a nice thought. I'm all for public rights, um, but uh, you know. What about other states? Well, Hawaii has gone much further than California with regard to the public trust. California has stuck to the traditional idea that somehow uh, the situation has to be tied in with navigable waters. I mean, in the Mono Basin, the dispute was over the diversion of fresh water out of the creeks, but that was impacting the saline water in the lake, and the lake back in 1924 was declared to be navigable by the courts. So we've had, in Hawaii, they just put all that aside. Uh, there was a judge, actually, in California that wanted to put it all aside. We had a public trust case on Puda Creek, which is not, not the lake that you see on campus here, but. It's the Puda Creek that is further south. Um, the, the old Puda Creek, we had a case on that when uh, you know, they wanted uh, the Solano interest to release more water, more various water to come down, and Peter knows all about that. But uh, the trial judge said he didn't think uh, it mattered whether there was any navigability, but that never got, that got settled before it went to the appellate court, so we don't have anything on that. But in Hawaii, they've said very clearly, public trust doctrine, they say it's constitutional. They say it's tied into Native Hawaiian rights. They say it applies to all water, groundwater, surface water, whether it's navigable or not. There's a big case that involved uh, moving water in, in the water. But anyway. Well, people are trying to public trust all over the country. Uh, trying it for climate change. I get this newsletter all the time. And, and I think the uh, Pennsylvania Supreme Court used its, they have a constitutional amendment to a clean environment or something, they invalidated the fracking law in Pennsylvania. And um, I don't know if they, they use the public trust, but they use their uh, constitutional right. They have a state constitutional provision. But uh, I get these, these newsletters regularly, and, and people are trying to raise the public trust all over the US in the context of water rights. Frequently, it's still being raised in the context of uh, shorelines and things like that. <laughs> But it, 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 people are trying to get it in, it in water rights, and um, my colleagues in the, in the Middle West, uh, the, what I call them, jokingly I call them Midwest, but they're, they, they make fun of me, but I mean the Mountain West, uh, Colorado and Wyoming and Montana and, and those states, those, those water rights systems are really very traditional in Idaho. They're pretty old fashioned, they're not, uh, so uh, they're doing in-stream flows by uh, somehow accommodating existing rights, but um, they don't have the flexibility that we have. In Idaho, the, uh, there were two or three different cases where the Idaho Supreme Court spoke very favorably about what had been done in California in the Mono litigation. Well, the Idaho legislature passed a statute. No, don't do that. So 
you only can get anywhere in Idaho if you find that it's somehow constitutional, that there's an implied constitutional public trust doctrine, which maybe there is, but that litigation hasn't happened yet. Now, the legislature hasn't tried to overturn the California public trust doctrine. The courts would always have the option of going in. And dealing with whether the legislature could actually do that, but nobody's tried. Uh, and actually, in the 2009 legislation that one of you mentioned, uh, there, I think the legislature for the first time said that the public trust doctrine is a fundamental principle of California water rights law and applies with particular force in the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta, which is a nice bridge to next week. Next week. Yeah, uh, they did that, and, uh, and that was nice. Sure. So we'll see. Thank you very much.